individuals, we can all do our part by practicing some basic measures that will reduce transmission, irrespective of what setting you're going to be in. And those measures include staying home when you're sick, and if you have symptoms, to get tested. As well, we have individual responsibilities that include cleaning our hands, wearing masks, especially important in public indoor spaces where crowd control is challenging and uh, ensuring that our environment is uh, clean. And for healthcare facilities, I think it's especially important that we uh, practice those basic measures, but also we have some additional things we need to be mindful of. On a daily basis, when assessing patients, we should be using the COVID-19 symptom checklist that's on Cerner. And this allows us to detect any individuals that might present with symptoms so that we can uh, take necessary precautions early on and do appropriate testing. For long-term care facilities, uh, what we've learned from some of the outbreaks is that staff can come to work sick with symptoms and this can result in an outbreak. So it's especially important for all healthcare workers to be mindful of symptoms and not come to work when they're ill. In our acute care and long-term care facilities, a lot of work is being done to look at our spaces, how we interact with the spaces that we have to maintain decluttering and keep an organized workflow. All these types of practices will help with reducing the risk of transmission. Transmission of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which causes COVID-19, is multifactorial. And as such, when we have an outbreak, the measures that we implement are also multi-pronged. Unfortunately, none of these measures are 100% effective on their own. And that's why we have to uh, pay attention to all the measures that we have in place. And during an outbreak setting, when we implement these measures, transmission can continue. And in those settings, transmission or detection of new cases may be because of a lag time of the disease and the incubation period. Although the measures may be successful, it still may be a period of time before we see a cessation of transmission in cases. When, despite all the measures that we have put in place and allowed for an observation period to see if they're effective, we continue to detect new cases, then we have to revisit what measures we need to augment and refine. And sometimes these are just basic measures, such as uh, ensuring that all staff are being very mindful of their symptoms when they come to work. Other measures that we need to reinforce uh, are related to behavioral measures, uh, such as hand hygiene and the skill of donning and doffing PPE appropriately. We know that the transmission of this virus can come in three forms, which includes contact, through droplets, as well as through aerosols. And therefore, we just need to have all the precautions ready so that no matter what context we're in, we're able to do a risk assessment and take the appropriate measures for that specific interaction and context. The purpose of keeping our environment clean or environmental hygiene is to decrease the burden of potential pathogens that are in the environment. And by doing so, this decreases the chance that even if we touch something and clean the environment on its own and disregarded all the other measures, we would not be very successful in decreasing nosocomial infections. So specifically at our hospital, uh, I think it's too early to say if the environmental changes uh, along with the other measures are having a long-term impact on other uh, healthcare associated infections because each type of healthcare associated infection has uh, a primary driver as well as secondary drivers. When we look at the multi-pronged approach that we take at decreasing healthcare associated infections, it includes things like optimizing the use of antimicrobials during uh, preoperative surgery, or decreasing antimicrobial exposure to reduce Clostridium difficile infections. In addition to 
those type of measures like antimicrobial prescribing, other basic practices like hand hygiene are very important as well, uh, as well as uh, when we do procedures using aseptic technique. SARS-CoV-2 virus, which causes COVID-19, is particularly difficult to control because asymptomatic individuals can have the disease and contribute to transmission. At this time, the testing that we have can be divided into PCR-based tests that detect nucleic acid of the virus. We also have uh, antibody and antigen tests that detect either the protein of the virus or the host's reaction to the virus as a marker for developing some form of immunity. Now at this time, all the tests that we have address particular questions and have utility really dependent on the context of what the question is. If we are looking for asymptomatic healthcare workers that may be involved in an outbreak situation, the test that we use will be a PCR-based test. And there are new PCR-based tests that are in development that try to find us an answer whether the genetic material is present or absent in a, a shorter period of time. These tests are in development and uh, at this time, we will have access to some of these tests pretty soon. However, it's important still to recognize that no testing procedure is perfect. And so we have to combine all the tools that we have and really think about the question we're trying to answer at the time to determine the most appropriate test to apply. In terms of the virus, we know that its survival on surfaces is going to be dependent on factors such as temperature, humidity, and other things such as UV exposure. That's why uh, well-ventilated environments and outdoor spaces uh, with higher humidity are actually beneficial in decreasing transmission. As we approach the winter months and as we go indoors uh, in places that have relatively lower humidity, we know that the virus will survive longer if brought into a, a, a room, for example. And that includes surviving longer on surfaces, as well as when these particles that have the virus are expelled from an infected uh, source uh, into the environment through aerosols and droplets. Unfortunately, the technology that we have that's scalable to change uh, temperature and humidity in uh, buildings is uh, currently limited. Uh, there are some things that can be modified uh, to a certain degree, and that's going to be based on balancing uh, the comfort for the individuals in a building, for example. Uh, the temperature has to really be maintained in an acceptable uh, range. But humidity changes can be an important component in decreasing uh, virus stability. Drugs such as acetaminophen uh, or antipyretics are not contraindicated in uh, those infected with COVID-19. I think it's important to find a balance of treating symptoms that may be uncomfortable for somebody experiencing this disease. So if someone has fever and is uncomfortable, it is appropriate to use uh, acetaminophen to uh, address the fever. When we think of glove use, uh, I would submit that uh, it has a uh, main purpose in decreasing the ability of a pathogen to go through the skin of the hands. And that's why when we are dealing with uh, procedures that where we're exposed to blood and bodily fluids, but the purpose of the gloves is to decrease the chance that pathogens in the blood or bodily fluids go through the skin in our hands if there's minor cuts. But this is not a route of transmission for SARS-CoV-2 virus. The purpose of the gloves in this scenario is to uh, decrease the burden of uh, pathogens on our hands, but at the same time, we still need to perform hand hygiene after and uh, before using gloves. So glove use is not going to be the silver bullet. And in fact, when we see people use gloves, uh, whether it be in the community or in hospital, Oftentimes, they forget to change the gloves. And in fact, that results in more 
transmission events because they could be touching an environment that's contaminated, having their gloves, and then contaminating other areas. Because there are so many different groups of uh, providers in a hospital, it does make it a challenge to accurately track every single one. However, we do our best and we have a process in place at Providence Healthcare, and that process uh, is also highly dependent on the healthcare worker. So as a provider uh, in a hospital, I think it's important to know what the processes are for reporting illnesses. So if you are uh, sick and cannot come to work, it's important to follow that process so that uh, initially there's an alert to the leaders in your area. And when you get tested, if testing positive, generally we send that information to occupational health and safety to check the database to determine if it's a healthcare provider. That process might be delayed by a bit, so it's important that if you are testing positive, to help us uh, ensure that uh, we take preemptive measures if they are required, it's important that you also contact your leader to inform them if you have a positive uh, uh, test for COVID-19. Many of the basic processes that we have in place are working. We just need to continue working together to ensure that we adhere to them. And where the, we find deficiencies, we work together with our leaders and our teams to augment the processes and refine those processes so that we can uh, continue to learn through this uh, pandemic together. It's important that we remember we're all in this together. In addition to taking care of yourselves, it's also important to take care of our team members, our colleagues and peers. So if we see uh, things that might be concerning, just have a conversation with people and ensure that people are uh, well prepared uh, at work. And that includes preparation mentally and physically. So uh, bottom line, take care of each other.